In Welcome Solutions, we help highly educated professionals with navigating towards their dream careers. We offer intensive career rotation courses, combining self-discovery with practical information about the job market. We also work on our own educational materials, such as books and self-navigation manuals. Our new tool, the Odyssey Test, will help you discover what your natural way of creating value in the job market is and which working environment will fit you best. If you'd like to stay in touch with us and receive monthly updates, please subscribe to the newsletter. Hello everyone, uh, this is yet another episode of Career Talks by Welcome Solutions. And in these meetings, we talk with interesting personalities and professionals with interesting career paths behind uh, to uh, tell us a little bit about their insights and share their, their awesome stories with us. Um, and today I have a great pleasure to introduce Miguel Heinonen, uh, who is a tech uh, entrepreneur and has worked in the startup community across the United States and the United Kingdom. He's the founder uh, and CEO of Horizon, an employment marketplace that pairs employees with employers. Horizon collates jobs by geogra geography to make sure that the users can find employment conveniently. Uh, Miguel bootstrapped and built the, uh, the, the company from the ground up, and he is an expert in building companies with little to no financial resources. He's, uh, he also serves as a board member, advisor, and he is an avid YouTuber. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Miguel, for joining us today. And I'm very curious to hear your story uh, told from your own perspective. Natalia, thank you very much for having me on your show, actually. This is, this is great. I look forward. Well, it's not that much of a show unless you take off your shirt. Maybe then it will be. <laughs> <laughs> That's another podcast for another time. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm, I'm very curious, how, how, how did it all start for you? Because I know that you're from Peruvian nationality. So uh, how did it happen that you moved out of Peru and you ended up in a startup community um, in the US and UK? And yeah, I'm, I'm very curious uh, about your path uh, up to this point. Yeah, uh, so I was, I was born in Peru in uh, South America, but I was adopted uh, the day I was born, and a couple of months later, we went to Switzerland, and after that, uh, we spent a lot of time in East Africa, so I grew up in Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, um, and um, in my high school, my parents thought maybe it'd be good if I went to a, a boarding school in, in England, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a good time there, but I thought it'd be great to go to military school in Texas, so I asked my mom, like, hey, listen, send me to the Marine Military Academy in Texas. And uh, yeah, I, I love the culture. I, you know, I grew up there for a couple of years and then I went to university in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and my best friend pretty much pushed me to go to university. He filled out um, pretty much, he just told me, hey, apply to Johnson & Wales University and do entrepreneurship. Had no idea what that was. Um, yeah, we both went to the same university and um, then that's when I fell in love with tech because there were all these websites and I was, I was just, you know, we were learning a lot about companies that were, you know, brick and mortar and, uh, you know, like about how to create businesses like, for example, bakeries or, you know, B2B services. But I knew at that point I wanted to have a website where it would affect lots of people, you know, even across the globe, even without have me having any interaction with them. And um, when I graduated, I, I ended up being a service charges accountant. Uh, and it, it wasn't for me. I, you know, after two years, it was enough to, to bootstrap my first startup. And um, I made a lot of mistakes in that first startup as well. Hence why I had to keep working for two years. Um, and uh, yeah, I just pushed my way into the tech community and uh, going to LA, I ended up working for a friend at a, a med tech company. And being young, he was like, uh, this is what I want the platform to look like. I work with developers and I learned a lot. And then um, luckily enough, uh, when I came back to the UK, I started working with a, a early stage um, uh, tech company, which taught me a ton about lead generation. And uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I onboarded about 2,500 uh, 
software vendors onto the platform. I talked to all the founders. I, you know, started understanding all their pain points and started giving them advice. And slowly, slowly, people started asking for help. And uh, it's been great. You know, I've been, uh, I work with quite a few different tech companies now, as uh, you, you mentioned, and I have my own uh, startup as well. And um, yeah, now, you know, during the lockdown, I now live here in London. The interesting point in your story, like there were many, but uh, one of them was that first startup that uh, that you set and that failed. So can can you tell us a little bit more? Because like I would like to learn a little bit more about business development in general and uh, and about the common mistakes people make. So was this uh, was uh, was your first failure in uh, in entrepreneurship? Um, was it, uh, it, it one of it the? It was a big software? failure. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I did the math. Yeah, the money that I spent in that startup, I could have brought. Uh, I could have bought a brand new Mercedes hardtop convertible. You know, I blew a lot of money on it. But you know, I'm glad that I went through that experience because now, from a mile away, I can see issues in many tech companies. And the problem wasn't that I didn't have a good idea. It wasn't that I didn't have a good solution, is I didn't know how to sell it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a great idea. And basically, the problem was I didn't have the skill sets to do mass outreach. Mm-hmm. And uh, even today, you'd be surprised. I work with so many companies, you know, I look at quite a few companies. And it's always the same issue. They just don't have the capacity nor the skill sets to do mass outreach, how to automate it, how to find leads. So this is where, um, you know, from those mistakes that I've made, I learned how never to do that again, you know. Uh, and when I built my next startup, all those principles, you know, that I learned um, in that mistake, I I it didn't make it on the new one. For example, let me give you a good example. On the first platform, we had the ability for many end users that they could log in the platform. So we had different permissions. We had, you know, master admins. We had, you know, guests that didn't sign up. We had people that signed up that could give other admin permissions. And, you know, at, at a, you know when, if you're not and don't have like the skill sets to build uh, um, these, these platforms, I, and I knew that going forward when I built this platform, I wanted a platform where everyone could view the data. It was more of a content site and no one had to log in. You know, so I learned and the only people that log in now are either the admins of my team or employers. And that was like an experience that I learned that, you know, you want to build a platform forum where you don't have too much maintenance you know and a great front end so yeah there were lots of experiences there uh, you know also about scaling up as well in costs um before i just wanted the best you know i was young and a little naive and i wanted the best server and now you know now i tell my developers like hey guys you know tone it down on the you know, on, on the, the server, like, you know, we only have so much traffic. I built this platform from, uh, by selling my iPhone. I was really not doing well. I was between jobs. I, uh, the first platform, I, um, I, I, I was, I was persistent and I, I knew that I loved the tech industry and I knew that if you do it well, you potentially exit very well. And, um, uh, I remember I, I, I had originally built another platform, but basically it was like Uber, but for employment, but the laws changed, you know, the dynamics changed. And I, I, I realized it was more of a C2C platform. And I re- that's not where the money is. I don't want to take money off people that, you know, that they work for like $10 an hour and I take $2. And I was like, ah, oh, this, is, this is not working. So I remember I just scrapped the entire platform platform uh i needed about 400 pounds so i sold my iphone x and i got about yeah 480 like yeah 400 to a back end developer i put everything in a powerpoint i said this is what i want the front end to look like and what can i get for this and uh yeah it was really rough cut but you know i realized again from all those experiences when i failed what is my core purpose? My core purpose is to find people jobs locally on a map. So that's what we did. We really stuck in a minimal where no, no one had to sign in, they could view it. 
And uh, yeah, just kept improving and improving and improving. We started building admin dashboards, uh, building digital displays, but uh, constantly, constantly, you know, making sure that every single penny that we put into the platform is, is um, you know, like it, 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 the, there's a return on the investment of the reason why we're doing it. And these are all experiences that I, I learned from my, <laughs> my first failure as a startup. But I mean, to be honest with you, you know, I, <clears throat> there, there is definitely, um, to a certain degree, they used to celebrate failure. I don't want to celebrate it. And I never want to have that learning experience again. But at a young age, it's such a valuable experience because from a mile away, I can look at a startup now. I'm just like, nope, these founders just don't have the capacity to do it, you know, or, you know, like I can tell when people are a little too aggressive, I'm like, hey, tone it down. Like, you know, you need end users first before you're going to spend this amount of money on, on building this. So that, that was a great experience. No, I don't ever want to learn again about failure, but uh, it was a great experience to have because it forced me to learn all these other skill sets for the next time. It's actually true uh, that also business development looks uh, easy from the outside. And it's a bit like you have all these courses and all these books about um, business development and, you know, these successful people that speak online. You know, you can watch Kevin O'Leary's uh, youtube channel and all these like multi-billionaires who who will tell you you know how to uh, be successful in business but in fact you cannot really learn it other in other way than by mistakes in fact so actually i come from academia myself and and uh, you know when you go through a phd like the output of your project should be academic publications and officially well you can technically learn uh, what about the process from books so or you know reading literature so well to to write a paper you have to uh, come up with a research question and you have to come up with a pipeline you have to come up with a way of testing your hypothesis and then just uh, do the test uh, do the experiment and then write uh, down the results and then you have a paper and then you send it out to a publication so it's like no big deal it's just a lot of work but um, technically, it looks from the outside, it looks like it was algorithmical, but when it comes to really doing it, <laughs> then uh, you have to get bust a few times to really learn that it's not enough to just uh, go according to the schedule because uh, you have to think in advance what type of project uh, you have to create and what type of hypothesis you have to frame to have a maximum chance of it working out because the fact that nobody did something like nobody mm -hmm. tested this hypothesis before might mean that you are a genius or it might mean that everyone who tried failed <laughs> because it's basically <laughs> not possible. So what are the odds of actually succeeding? And you have to uh, fail multiple times to really learn what the, uh, how to weight um, risk and reward and how to frame a project so that it always has some safe side so there is at least, even if it doesn't like turn out the way you want it, you still have a bit that is still kind of publishable. And then you have to know when you wrap up the, so you package your um, findings and wrap up a manuscript, how you have to pitch to the editor of the journal to sell it best. So that even if you didn't get all the results you hoped for, then it's still something that is attractive enough to the receiver to still publish it. So it really, it's in many ways, it rem like reminds me business development. And so that, that, that I recognize very well. I, I mean, everything you just said is the perfect startup, you know, of where it looks easy in the outside, we're going to get users, you got to build the protocols, you've got to build what type of end users, you got to get feedback, you got to submit it. Mm -hmm. The only difference that your point was at some point, you need even more capital you know, and uh, just to keep the wheels turning. And uh, no, everything you're saying is, is it's, it's exactly very similar. The only thing that, you know, that, I mean, actually they're, they're both similar. Just one more thing as well is that you need persistence as well. You know, like, you know, if I were smart, I would have stopped what I was doing 
you know, and I would have got a, a job at Deloitte or one of those big consulting firms. I was so adamant that I want to stick on this road. I did it, you know. Uh, for a moment, I was scared as well, you know. There was a moment I was actually scared. I'm like, Jesus, now I'm like, you know, I'm like 32 years old and, uh, you know, I'm borrowing money off my brother every now and then because I paid, you know, a lot for the development. But, yeah, you know, um, thank God, like, I, I've crossed that threshold. But my point is, is that uh, you got to be persistent. You got to have thick skin. And, and more importantly, you got to be an optimist. You know, this is you know, this is sometimes is a long learning curve. Right. Yeah, I also, I, I mean, I'm quite positive about my company at the moment, but I also sometimes have those thoughts. Uh, you know, if I went to a company straight after my contract expired in 2017, then until now I would be just uh, living safely. And, you know, I would probably, in terms of like, like, total value of my salary it would be like 200,000 euros no what's the fun in that though you know there is no fun in security you live once you know and also the truth is if you build something you know like uh you know what we were talking about earlier I don't want to mention in case it's not public yet but um you know that's a huge exit for you you know what I mean and you monetize off that and you can be on the beach somewhere having a martini and uh you know like uh it's something that you built you know and yeah, yeah so and, and plus it's you know both the platforms my platform your platform are monetizable you know so i wouldn't be worried i think you just need to make sure you present better than anyone i think many people think that they have to have something so unique and something so different but it's the simple things and people that are easy for people to understand is what people buy. And that's, you know, at a younger age, because you kept hearing disruption, 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 disruption. Everyone is in a mindset like I've got to build the next Uber. But people forget, actually, people are not always looking for the next Uber. People are just looking for convenience. And, you know, there's always competitors out there. Yeah. Just be better than them. You know, even if you're small, like my company, we're small. I mean, we are so small compared to like, you know, Monster, Indeed, but damn, do we look good. You know what I mean? When the end user comes there, they feel comfortable. We have no no traffic compared to them, of course, you know? But the point is, is that when people come to our site, they feel like, wow, the, 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 the UI is very simple. It's very clean. You know, they can get reports. So yeah, I, I've never felt threatened. I think uh, you just gotta do it better than the other guy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not difficult to have a better UI than Monster or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say it's hard to have worse. <laughs> but uh, in, I, I agree, I mean, indeed. And, and also, I would say one thing is, it's enough if you do something a little bit better than others, but there are also lots of blind spots. There are like little problems that are inconvenience for a lot of companies who would like to pay for the solution. And no one, it's also that many businesses they are, um, or like entrepreneurs, they are so busy with saving the world, you know, coming up with the next uh, cure for cancer and the next big thing yeah. uh, that they overlook those opportunities. And actually yesterday I released a blog post on my blog about that and there are so many uh, wordpress plugins that are necessary and that are just nowhere to be found and this like wordpress plugin is a very like viable business model and those those successful plugins there are multi-million businesses and and these are like very simple uh, simple functionalities that nobody programmed and although at, at the core is just a few lines of code, in fact, and yeah, uh, things I mean, like honestly, simplicity sells. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, you know, you really have to think about the elevator pitch constantly. I, I, you know, the first platform that I had, I think I tried to make it too genius. And I was really going down the road of making it disruptive. Mm-hmm. Now, when people ask, what do you do? I help people find jobs and I help, you know, that's, it's so simple to explain. It's an employment platform. I don't try and get, you know, brave and say, well, yeah, we use AI to push, you know, why, why do that, you know? And yeah, simplicity sells, you know, so. That's right.
That's right. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what your platform does? Whom would you recommend to take a look at your platform and uh, what type of services you offer and maybe whom you work with on this platform? A sure. little bit more about your business. Sure. Well, um, the platform is called Horizon. And um, uh, so basically it, it is an employment platform, but uh, I wanted to get in tech for years. And I kept going to these horrific websites like Indeed, Monster. And I realized that every time I went there, some of these jobs were like, you know, been expired for months. But it was so good for SEO. They pulled me in there and they say, here are other similar jobs that are alive. And then I realized on these platforms, there's so many recruiters as well that they don't even tell you who you're applying for. So you would send a resume and it would say, hey, we're looking for, you know, um, a marketing executive who's got experience in, you know, the the FMCG you know industry, and it do, it doesn't do much for you. Like I want to know who I'm actually applying for so I can tailor my CV or resume for for the company. So I and I was also really visual as well, and I just you know at the end of the day I really imagined of just having a map because I loved Uber the business model of Uber. So in my mind, I was going to have a map and a pin of all the local jobs around you. And I could see actually the company. So we did it. Uh, and like, again, like I told you, we sold, I sold my iPhone, uh, you know, and we built the, the, the basic MVP. But now, you know, uh, if you're looking for a job and you don't have to go to multiple different websites, our platform aggregates all the local jobs around you uh, and so if you're in Berlin, it would show you all the tech companies, for example, physically around you, show you where your office in proximity, you can learn about the company because the companies have profile pages and then you can see what jobs are available from remote to, you know, uh, on site as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, we, anytime a job is expired, it's taken off our system within 24 hours, which because we were moving so many jobs on a, almost on a daily basis in the hundreds, it actually is terrible for us SEO, but at least our end users know that the jobs there are, are alive and legit. So yeah, we're pretty big now. Uh, in London, we're, we're, we're quite big. In uh, Paris, we're growing. Uh, in Denmark, we're growing. But yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's been fun. You know, uh, our next goal right now is to make sure that we've got thousands of jobs being pushed daily across the globe. And uh, there's no borders. I want this to be used everywhere. And we're not charging companies uh, at all at, the, at this period during the, the Corona season, I guess. And um, yeah, I just want to post as many jobs on to end users across the globe. That's very impressive. And um, can I ask uh, how you, um, like how you put postings on the website? Is it, that you work with corporate clients? We provide technically uh, employee candidate lead generation. And um, many uh, companies have two choices. E either A, post the jobs themselves and pay for the advertising on Indeed, Monster, Read if they want A's, um, or B, they hire a recruiter and spend about 50% of the annual uh, you know, earnings of that candidate. So if the employee they're looking for is a hundred thousand a year, that's, you know, 50 to 20 grand sometimes, uh, as an upfront payment to the agency. So what we decided to do was to work with, uh, SMEs to say, listen, at the fraction of the cost, just post a job here and we will direct traffic to your career page, and your ATS and, uh, the applicant tracking, uh, softwares that many companies use. And, um, uh, and, and it's a fraction of the cost. So I mean, to post, you know, uh, up to 20 jobs in our platform is almost about $200 per month. As uh, some agencies, they charge you $200 for one job for about a week. So yeah, we're just, uh, as we're new, you know, pricing is not uh, as important for us. It's more important to get end users. So we're just doing lots of outreach right now to get SMEs to just, you know, post freely in our platform. So um, uh, uh, in, in the times of Corona crisis, did your, uh, was your business hammered in any way? Because 
uh, there are so many businesses today that go online and they just start accepting remote employees. So did it in any way affect your business model? <laughs> yeah, uh, hardcore. I mean, think about it. My platform is a map with local jobs. Right. Do you know what I mean? Those local jobs right now, people are staying home. So, uh, and at that point, everyone was looking at a remote job. So we actually pivoted our platform a bit uh, where we now have a dedicated remote section. So on the page, wherever you're located, if you're located in London, Bulgaria, doesn't matter where, there's a button that shows you all the remote jobs that people are hiring within your city. So um, yeah, it's been getting the most traffic still today. Uh, we get a lot of traffic on the remote job section. So yeah, that, that changed things a lot. Um, you know, uh, what else did change? But yeah, so, you know, lockdown is almost over, but um, because we gather so much data, because we gather so much data and um, it's very visual and it's our data because we clean it up. I, I, I created a digital display for universities, charities, uh, and I'll explain it. So basically the premise is, is that we could create these uh, light boxes that uh, they're digital displays that you could tag only specific jobs to be displayed. So for example, if there's a culinary school, you know, for students learning to cook, I can place one of these displays, it's white labeled, but all the students can see all the jobs in their city of hiring in their industry for like line cooks, bar staff, you know, for internships and it's scalable for fashion schools where you could put all the fashions, uh, you know, institutes, um, institutions, you know, retail stores that are hiring. And uh, this is free, uh, but it is a, it's, it's touchpad. And obviously with COVID, I don't think people, and it's not the right time right now to be selling touchpad services. So um, yeah, we were gonna go live, uh, uh, but now I'm, I'm waiting. And uh, we've got a couple of universities uh, willing to deploy it in their school. Uh, it's just now we'll have a note to make sure to wipe the display after you're done. We'll have the uh, spray bottle as well as the cleaning. When you're done, you'll have to clean the screen. So yeah, but definitely like everyone, we just have to adapt and overcome. Yeah, you would think that, you know, if you have an online platform, then you're safe in Corona times, but not even then. No. Uh, would, uh, <laughs> probably it also de de depends on what type of um, jobs you offer, right? So probably for blue collar workers, um, the distance, you know, still matters even today, but you probably offer more of the white collar positions and that's the problem, right? Because Yeah, yeah, you know... Uh... I mean, there will always be jobs. I think, obviously, the media is brightly so covering of, of what's bad going on, and obviously, like a lot of closures and in, in in the businesses, like you know, major retailers. But there are a lot of companies hiring as well. I mean, we run reports uh, on a daily basis of all like the new jobs that we're gonna put into Horizon. And we're just amazed constantly about how much more new jobs and you know some of these companies are growing and hiring more. So it's not always doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. Right. I also think that uh, given that you're, uh, you're in London, I think you know London has its own culture and there will always be these um, places in the world like London on, or some other big cities where people really want to stay there and they, they want to work there because they feel like it's a, a its own micro microcosmos, you know, that's uh, they don't want to leave and they don't want to work outside because they really want to build their life, professional life in that space. And yeah, even in the times of uh, like remote work, I think there will be still lots of people who still prefer to keeping the same the same environment even if it's uh, online so mm. uh, at least yeah but it, the, the, the job market is changing indeed and uh, and and probably even after the lockdown is over probably <laughs> still uh, there will be lots of remote jobs left and that yeah. it's not going to come back to the same state 
of affairs that it was before the crisis, that's for sure. I don't think people are going to be called back in just immediately. I mean, incredibly, you know, uh, and I've seen this with many companies in the last, you know, year or so. Mm -hmm. And London is so expensive. And the average payroll for someone in their 30s over here in you know, operational roles, whether funded or not funded, is about 27 to 35. That's the average payroll. And, and London is just so expensive. And I've seen so many of my friends move out of the city. They got rid of their leases. You know, this is as well as in the US as well, like in those major cities, they just moved you know, close to the families that tomorrow, if they said, hey, we're opening up the offices, the logistics are just not possible because you have employees now all across the country, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think, yeah, this is definitely something, I think it's gonna be a long time before people comfortably shake hands and exchange business cards. I'm very curious about the next trade show of how that's gonna look like at the London Excel. Um, but um, yeah, like I think there is definitely a change. I think remote is going to stay a long part of, uh, it's going to be, you know, for a long part of, of our culture for a while, I think, you know, in mm -hmm. the next few years and maybe a couple of days on site. Right, right. Um, okay, so at the moment you have um, postings of jobs in the UK and you said France as well. Yeah, France, a lot of the US, New York, uh, Dallas, San Francisco, uh, San Diego. So we're growing, we're growing and growing and growing. So yeah. it's, uh, uh, are these, uh, for people who might be potentially interested, are these uh, uh, profiles, jobs profiled in any way or um, like general white collar positions? Uh, yeah, mostly right now in the tech industry. Uh, the reason why we decided to start there is I know the tech industry. So I knew how to classify them. I knew about the type of roles. Then we started going into, uh, there are a lot of now SMEs that are posting. So uh, that are not exactly tech, but they still are looking for people with operational experience mm -hmm. and we're, we're cost effective. So I'm, I'm happy that we get the post done. But originally it was just trying to, to find tech roles, but we have over 30 different uh, 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 categories now so you can actually just filter like I only want to see jobs in the startup community or I just want to see jobs in you know the the hospitality industry we have multiple now categories and also a uh, specific section just for um, executives okay and that's the that that sounds really great that there is a section for that as well yeah. uh, that's also uh, for PhD graduates that I have lots to do with uh, that's that's the, the hardest category to get when you when you leave academia. So it's good that um, yeah, you you can find those uh, at your platform. Uh, all right. Uh, so I'd like to uh, learn a little bit more about business development from you, since you have to have this experience to effectively uh, effectively kick off a company from starting from one iPhone. Um, <laughs> So let's, uh, let's imagine that uh, there is a person, let's say I, I come to you and ask, well, I have an iPhone, where is it? I have an iPhone, <laughs> I'm willing to trade it. Uh, and uh, what do I do next to, uh, to build a company uh, yeah. in 2021? What would you say? What are the first five steps? What is the most important to do? Yeah, so the first thing I would definitely ask you is what's gone wrong that you had to sell your iPhone. And in my case, it was one of those situations out of like, I, I really had a sense of urgency to do it. But I always tell people, hey man, like don't quit your day job until you make more money with your platform than what you're making at your current job. Because at the end of the day, you're gonna pay rent, buy food, you know, take your girlfriend out for drinks, dinner, dates, like, you know, it costs, all of it costs money, you know? So uh, I bootstrapped for years uh, and even today, like, you know, I have an advisory roles. And sometimes, you know, at least I have the capacity to pay developers as well. But um, the first thing to do really is just to do it at the most cost-effective uh, price by building an MVP, which is a, a minimal viable product. So basically, 
strip it down on your idea to the core. If you can't explain what your platform does, you know, in less than like 30 seconds, it's going to cost you money. You don't want that. You want to build something where you have the ability to, to, to build like a prototype, get feedback from end users, make sure they understand what it is that you're looking for. B, you know, making sure that it's scalable as well. So you want to know that the code that you built, you know, there are many other developers that can take over the project and start building upon that. So uh, today you may have heard, but one of the most common type of developers are called full stack developers. So, uh, you know, I worked with a full stack developer. I went on Upwork and met this great guy and uh, we built our relationship up there. We've just constantly working together on uh, building many different uh, platforms. Uh, so now he works directly with us, but it was the best way to get started. You know, and uh, I got a lot of feedback, you know, like people liked certain things, people didn't like certain things. For example, we didn't have, it used to be just a map and people would click it, but then people said, nah, we just want a list on the left side, we built it, you know? So yeah, you just gotta constantly keep evaluating. Uh, what your platform is, how you know clean it is. Is it like do the end users understand what it is, and then start calculating? Well, how much does it cost? And and that's the thing as well is that it costs money, especially in tech. You know, to make all these changes, two things you need to do is a make sure that every time you build something, you ask yourself how much does this cost? What's my return? And you know, what are the worst case scenarios? Like for example, if I do it, it may break you know, or um, my developer has too much, you know, um, you know, it's going to slow him down. And the other question that you should really ask yourself is, can you really afford this as well? You know, like, do your end users really need this? So, you know, that's, that's the first thing is just keeping it simple, um, you know, uh, and making sure as well that uh, you can afford it and you're always eating at night. I mean, my case it was just a real sense of urgency. But it's, I think it's uh, an open debate what is better, actually, because I also know, I also have friends who would be wonderful business developers, I feel, and I definitely have uh, good, uh, you know, business acumen already, even before they start the company, I think, because every time I talk to them, I, I feel, I feel that they, they have it, they, they have what it takes, but they never really uh, took the decision to try. Yeah. Because they have this belief that uh, the creators don't have enough cash yet and they keep on working in startups and, and, and procrastinate uh, starting a business for way too many years already. And the point is there is no, never a perfect moment to start. So they are um, like sitting on a, like a pail of cash and take in very expensive courses in uh, marketing and uh, they just try to pump up even more before they they start yeah but... it's it's a fear like everyone is like it, it takes a lot it takes a lot of courage to actually say hey i'm gonna do this i'm gonna let everyone know i'm doing this and i'm gonna commit to it you know and some people do feel comfortable you know having someone experienced that they'll pay it's 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 crazy i mean some of the, some of the companies i've worked with in the past like pay people like premium dollars overpriced just to have someone guide you it doesn't make sense to me it never has it never has made sense unless it's like they have a technical skill set you know mm -hmm. i think i think another important part to really talk about as well um because people like comfort and um uh like guidance and someone to talk to I get very, very hesitant when people try recruiting other people to join their startup without pay. Because you'll notice that they'll say, hey, yeah, I'll give you 20%. And they always end up walking off or they don't execute and there's a whole dispute. And uh, A, make sure people are always paid because then there's a, an agreement. You know, you're paid for X, Y, and Z. But when it's your friend and you talk about it and he doesn't do anything, you start resenting them, you know? So always make sure, and never, there are too many people, especially like in the first time, they're like, hey, if you build a code, I'll build a business model, I'll be a business partner, don't do it because your developer always needs to, you know, your subordinates, your colleagues, your partners always need to have food money, right. you know? 
So I just tell people, make sure you pay people. Most people who uh, who uh, offer shares, they offer it because they don't have cash to pay. That's that's the problem, and that's uh, that's that's the common problem of uh, first time entrepreneurs that they just start from from scratch. Like my in my experience, what you can also leverage on is your own skills. So try to find yeah. people who you can barter with. Um, like what it works for me, I work as a career advisor and I often help people as exchange for doing something else for me. Or uh, I also found good developers through Upwork and even through Fiverr. And like I know that uh, what they were paid is uh, nowhere com- near to what they should be paid because the uh, work they did was amazing. Uh, but th- that was all I could afford at that point. But at the same time, I just try to always um leave people with more by for instance recommending them to more high ticket clients like some other people i know who are much more wealthy than me and or um, promoting them through the website so putting their name in the book putting their name on the website of the company you know trying to also i I agree with you that i think i I actually absolutely agree with you here that yeah but this is one of those things that it's a it's a a paid exchange you know for an agreed set of services and i i love like writing reviews saying hey this is a great developer you know contact him his skill sets are definitely outside that box i just mean that you will find that many people love to have comfort and try and give up equity but if things fall apart because people are always trying to get paid first you know and there's always like, hey, I can't do it after work. I can only maybe do this as a part time, and mm-hmm. people get upset. And I'm, I'm I'm saying that you should definitely be comfortable to to do a lot of things on your own, especially to get the wheels turning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I also I also don't 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 uh, offer shares. Uh, that yeah, one. Yeah. That's one of the reasons also then. That, then I would feel the burden that it has to work or otherwise someone doesn't get paid for what they did for me. So that's indeed, um, that's not a good karma. <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Because you basically take real work from people for the promise of something. That's what, what you do when you pay with shares. And that's, yeah. uh, that's uh, like selling people, yeah, dreams. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. Like I just rather pay people, yeah. you know. Uh, also, I can't just give out shares anymore. I have a board, so <laughs> I got to always ask their permission now. Well, actually, uh, but I also know how it feels from the other side, from a person who uh, got shares on paper that are now worthless. Because uh, in two years ago, I was also involved in one blockchain project, and I spent two months writing a white paper and. And I was promised some shares, but until now, nothing changed in this project. So I'm like, okay, uh, well, you know, if you don't see any changes on the website, they didn't launch, even though they planned to do so two two years ago. Probably they are nowhere now, and and probably uh, before it it will not be like worth anything in the future. Probably, I wish them well, but like uh, just realistically looking at it, uh, it's probably like two months of work just for yeah no it, it 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 happens i mean don't get me wrong it's great experience as well yeah. you know but now you're a lot more aware like what happened to me when i dropped the ball in my first startup now from a mile away someone offers you equity you're like you know what took the equity and some pay just for an agreement of me putting a couple of weeks worth of, of work here you know right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah no well. it's true empty promises it happens you know like uh and it's just not a bad i don't think it's out of malice it's just mm-hmm. not, not experience you know yeah it's, it's also you know this enthusiasm uh like uh overestimating your chances in the market and so i don't i also don't think it's a it was a vile play of any 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 kind it's just more like lack of experience indeed and also like when you are um uh, not a founder, but just a, like a core team member. In fact, you don't have that much uh, influence on the company. You're one of six, eight, ten people who are involved. So even if you do uh, everything perfectly well, then you still have minor impact on whether or not this company will be successful. So that that I also learned, and and now like I design my own company in a way that I have uh, complete control over what's happening and. 
if the company fails, it's all on me. So I cannot blame anyone. I hey, you're so close. Anyone. I can't wait. I can't wait till uh, yeah. I get to see it live. I think, uh, yeah. Plus, we've already done the setup. It's going to look hot. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm positive about it. I think uh, in a year or two, I will see a real uh, benefits from what I do right now. And I, I, at, the, at the moment, I'm quite positive about the future. But I think it helps me actually. It helps me. The the fact that I all the blame is on me. It actually yeah. it, it helps me rather than uh, making it difficult. Yeah. And and you know, it's still I don't I never feel alone because there are so many friends with companies and we exchange information. I got so much good advice from you and like uh, and so many other people. So it never even if you are a solopreneur, you're never really alone unless you are a completely you know unless you're a, a weird type of person who cannot really speak with others you know if you're a very aloof maybe then you you are in trouble but if you're sociable i think and we need to share as well then i think you'll be fine in uh, in either case okay um and i have another question about uh, your opinion uh, on um these uh, expensive programs for entrepreneurs and expensive courses like I actually, I have to say, at the moment we are running an experiment with a friend of mine who is, a, he's a big fan of investing in himself. Uh, and what, am I, what I mean by that is that he can spend 50,000 euros on, uh, or 50,000 dollars on um, going for master studies on Oxford for, you know, on his own cost and 15,000 euros on uh, sales, um, salesprocess.io course that is, you know, like this most expensive course for uh, salespeople. And he recently, a few few months ago, he bought such a course and he literally, he paid 15,000 from his own pocket because he believed that uh, it was the best option to learn about sales before he starts his own biz business. And we made a bet. So I, I bought a course for 10 euros from Udemy, a course about online marketing. And he bought this one for 15,000. <laughs> And we are, dark. yeah, and we are actually now in the race. So we have one year to actually to uh, learn about sales. And he is learning from, from that course. I'm learning from Udemy. Uh, but when I've seen, like, when I've seen a few slides from that course, I was shocked because uh, it's like sometimes I feel this is just too complex to be true because I've seen complex models of how the dynamics of the company should look like and they even calculate integrals they really they have like uh, differential equations to solve and these these models are like i was like is this real because how can you predict a company how can you model it with equations like this like this is so like the, the market is so unpredictable you have so little information you have there is so much you you don't know like how can you so so i felt this is just uh overfitting the data and uh, maybe um, just uh, just too much uh, and, and maybe taking a simple approach and just following what the clients, you know, following the money and just uh, listening to the client is enough. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm curious about what is your attitude to those expensive tools and is there any like insider's knowledge about business development that only people who pay 15,000 for a course get that is like a secret knowledge that no one else, um, like people like me, like poor business developers who start from scratch, that people like me don't know, uh, or yeah, or um, anyone can build a company with courses for ten euros. And uh, what do you think about it? I I mean personally, you know, I went to uh university and this course subject was entrepreneurship and i hate to say it but all those things that i learned in class never really even came to it i mean i remember you know how to you know like um how to write off like you know and get back like a tax credit that was never there you know uh you know about uh, how to get rid of a founder and get back your shares that definitely wasn't in the class, you know, uh, about how to network and, and, and uh, you know, I, I used to go to LA just trying to, to network over there. Like this is things, 
you learn textbook, you know, I mean, like, and, and when you look at these courses as well, I guess some people just want to feel like they have some experience, but it's the moment you're out of that class, you've only learned theory and like the real life of what it's like to have an employee right now that, you know, it, 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 it's, it, everything is actually pretty brutal. For example, you know, now you have a situation of where you don't really need this employee. What do you do with them? It's actually more cost effective for you to just get rid of them, you know, because you're not paying yourself, you know? So these are things that you don't really learn in classes. And I think sometimes you just, uh, me personally, I would never pay for those courses. That's my, you know, my, my honest uh, uh, opinion for myself. But there are some people out there that, um, that do pay for it because they feel comfortable. What I don't like is that some of these companies are, are making almost guarantees saying, by the time you leave our class, and I feel that that's taking, and they're preying on people of these insecurities. Mm -hmm. And that I really don't like. I, I really don't like. I mean, you know, I, I'm a YouTuber, and I see a lot of these fake gurus, you know, where you know, they're promising, like, listen, if you just go on my course right now, you're going to make so much money and it's going to be automated. You don't have to work. And I'm just, you know, I, you know, I understand about automation, you know, like, and so be it, maybe it does work, but I do not like how, you know, there's, it's, it, people have the ability and it's never going to change. People are always going to be insecure and pay for education. But in my mind, I'm like, listen, why would you wait two years to build your tech company or your startup and learn about something where you can learn it on the go? You know what I mean? And right. only you will know better about this industry. Like, I, I know my industry very well. And I don't think, you know, I really do feel like if anyone trying to build a platform like that, I'm an authority in that, not a guy who's teaching me from a textbook or a lecturer you know, and that's because I put in the hard work. So I don't know. I, I, I feel that every time I see those ads, it's very, very predatory, you know, and they're guaranteeing people. And just the fact that, you know, this guy is putting 15,000, you know, into, you know, these courses, you have them on YouTube. You literally would just type in YouTube, you know, the best leadership principle, you know, the three types of leadership delegative, authoritative, what type of leader are you, you know, and, and these are life experiences, you know, like you can find, I, I just, I find it asinine, mm -hmm. you know, to spend that type of money, especially when you want to get in a startup, you know, so. And that's yeah. also why I didn't go for an MBA because some, some people are telling me, and I, I personally even have friends who after PhD, they went for MBA studies. Uh, and I didn't want to go there. I felt I am done with studies. I know I'm in my 30s. I'm absolutely done <laughs> for this incarnation. And uh, and I, I didn't feel that that would be a best way to learn about business, that business is a streetwise knowledge. And yeah. um, it's exactly, that's a great thing. I mean, it, it, it is very, you have to be street smart to a certain degree, you know trying to find like the best discounts and like, hey, listen, help me build this for you and uh, I'll help out boost your, your, you know, your profile, like you were saying, you're right. You know, these are things you don't learn, you know, mm -hmm. about trying to save a buck or partner or even for us, we, we partner with other companies to help us get more traffic. And obviously that's me like going on their site saying, yeah, it's a great product. There are partners, you don't learn that in schools, you know, but, um, mm -hmm. I think it's also very important, you know, there are some of these social media influencers that are always preaching about business. Mm -hmm. And I used to hate them. I used to, because to me, it was regurgitated content and very, very basic. And then it took me a long time to realize there are actually some people out there that this is not common knowledge, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So then now I'm just like, well, actually, it actually is very good information. And to someone who doesn't have the experience, actually, it's actually really good content, actually. Yeah. But uh, I just, I don't, I don't like it when they pray and people guaranteeing them, right. you know, guarantee success. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, if you, 
uh, there is a, a channel on YouTube called Contrapreneur Bingo. It's about all these like fake courses. And uh, actually, funny enough, uh, the price always ends with seven, number seven. So if you see a course that is priced at, let's say, 1997, it's yeah. usually a shady course and like it's easy to recognize. For some reason, they all like end with number seven. I, just, I better change one of my pricing because I think one of my pricing is 197 for 10 jobs. <laughs> yeah, you have to check it out. Like this is like motivated by some psychological studies that apparently the seven at the end is kind of subconsciously uh, incentivizing people to buy. But just check it out because so my uh, birthday is December 27th. So, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, if I've I see always been a salesman. If I see a price ending with seven, I will never buy. <laughs> so, because it's yeah, a red light for me. You, you made me conscious about my pricing. Now maybe I put. Uh, you should put yeah. seven and a half. Then it's not seven. Yes, 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 seven. Yeah, look, I'll send you a screenshot later of my pricing. Maybe I should change it. <laughs> uh, yeah, just add fifty cents, and then it's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and actually, uh, and do you know this um, TV show, The Apprentice? I was curious. What's your opinion? I have seen a couple of times. Yeah, I've seen it a couple of times. Well, like, I... I, actually, I know that it's controversial, but uh, and I know I, I know what people think about Trump, but I think it's it was a great, uh, uh, I mean, great idea. And I think when you think about the team dynamics and what is actually valued in business. And yeah. you listen to these, especially the boardroom conversations. Uh, it taught me a lot about business. And I feel like it was quite useful. It was much use, more useful for me than uh, all these textbooks. Because I was also going through entrepreneurship courses, like yeah. courses for uh, for PhD students. And like what I learned from Trump <laughs> was so much more useful in the end. Uh, I, so, I, I like the show when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger took over. <laughs> that guy, yeah, he took over while Trump was uh, I know. in presidency. Yeah. I, I watched a few episodes with Arnie, uh, but honestly, he didn't have that charisma. That he didn't have, like for me, uh, the boardroom, like boardroom part was not as interesting anymore. It's a, yeah. I mean, hey, I, I, you know, <sighs> Hey, I, I love Arnie. I grew up on Arnie, you know. And yeah, as a kid, I had uh, Terminator 2 on uh, VHS. I was like six years old watching Terminator 2, a Commando, Kindergarten Cop, you know, Total Recall. I, I grew up on Arnie, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, I'd be honest with you, the reason why I never liked it was that I think it was also, it was, it was a lot of entertainment. I've met so many people, you know, just working at local jobs that they could have done a, a lot better job. You know, I feel like for entertainment, yeah, you know, it just wasn't for me, you know, but I always wonder, like, maybe I should apply for that one day, you know, for that show, you know, just to see what my skill sets lie or am I a, you know, a total idiot and screw everyone over because I forget to do something, you know, so yeah, maybe I should do it. Yeah, maybe I should challenge myself. I'm not sure. I, I probably would never have appear in a TV show of like any type of reality show or a show like I'm those. a vlogger, so I'm 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 the total opposite. I would. <laughs> oh you would. Oh nice. Yeah, why not? Let's see. Let's see. If I can find the time, maybe I apply. But like my point of view is that usually you can lose more than you can gain. Because it's easy to get pictured as a fool, you know, like th these, you know, uh, confessionals that you make yeah. on the show, they basically cut them to picture you in a specific way. They basically create some persona and it's usually not as you are. And I, I heard so many stories about this. I would not. And then they just decide like straight away, you will be the bitchy one or you will be the, <laughs> you will yeah. be the goofy one or you will be the idiot. And they, they will frame you in a way that they need for the show. And these like, um, yeah, it's, it's a show at the end of the day, like none of these people, I mean, some of them are just like, wow, like this guy, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like it's, it's, it's for entertainment, I think at the yeah, end but, of the day. You no, know, these shows 
like celebrity like like the uh, apprentice or any other like um, show like this they have these like bibles and there is a format in the bible it's like a, a bit like a screenplay it's like a, about a hundred pages and like everything is explained there how the formula of the whole show looks like and it's like uh, you know if you have a jury for instance uh, like a like a committee that assesses candidates then uh, there has to be always like one critical person there and one goofy person and one uh, like understanding emotional person and you know that the and if you have like a group of people for the apprentice then they all also have to be like uh, two bitchy types and two you know well, then uh, i play the bully i'll be two, the bully two so. bullies two teddy bears you know they always and they will just try to frame you in that role so i'll uh, i'll try to be the alpha that everyone hates <laughs> Yeah. Well, but there is already an alpha, right? Like so, Trump uh, or or Arnie, and then uh, they kind of, uh, you know, uh, they don't. Yeah, I mean, it's completely not for me. Uh, I know that for sure. You know what? Now you make me really want to be in uh, The Apprentice. <laughs> I think after this uh, podcast, I'm okay, gonna go see well, if I can apply. <laughs> let's, see, let's see. Well, I mean, good luck. Um, I would be worried about you if you apply, but. Uh, because of the, because of the I know how television works so oh, of course of course that's why you're just gonna have a winning smile <laughs> all right well maybe I just I mean I like those like I like the apprentice but maybe I, I'm just trying to justify why I spend so much time on YouTube like watching <laughs> yeah I tell you I tell you I've learned so much from YouTube I learned all my uh, Photoshop mm -hmm. skills and video editing skills on YouTube you know. Mm -hmm uh i've learned a lot you know at some point i need to learn to dance that's my next thing i i uh yeah i'm going to a wedding in uh, september i've just been invited i need to brush up my uh skill sets you know but it's incredible what youtube you can learn you know and also listening to so many authorities you know and, and so much thought leadership on there and advice it can be really inspiring that's what i'm saying i don't think you need to feel like you can only get that in uh institutional okay paid you know you can get it anywhere and i also feel you know because um like i'm also working on my second book right now and i i'm concentrated on how people navigate in the job market and what are the differences between those who navigate really well and those who cannot really find find their way and i feel that uh, the way of learning new things is different and because um you know the, the, whether or not you are successful in the long run doesn't depend on how well you learn when learning is intended like you know every student gets the same textbook at studies and they just have to memorize the you know the information so that doesn't like create any differences between people what really creates differences is whether or not you can extrapolate what you see and learn something that was not intended so for instance you watch a stupid show but you can learn from there, for instance, hey, why did this person get to the final and the other person didn't? And what are the winning strategies here? And what is the, you know, so it's something more than what you were intended to get out of it. So you were intended to get pure entertainment, but in fact, you learned something extra because it made you think. And some people are more thoughtless and just try, they always get extra information that was not intended uh, to, to be conveyed compared yeah. to others who just consume it, what they see and they, they have no questions about it. So uh, so I think you can learn from almost anything, even standing in a queue to a store, you can still learn something if you look around. And the same with TV and uh, reality TV. And you can always uh, learn something if you have that mindset that whatever you see, you just question what you see. and. Uh, try to uh, get um, some extra insights uh, that are beyond what is just served to you. And um, anyways, that was like more philosophical. <laughs> I get it though. No, it's absolutely true. No, keep learning. That's, you know, especially in the entrepreneurship world, you always have to learn and adapt quick. Okay. So uh, Miguel, like, uh, lastly, I'd like to ask you just to, in general, if you have any gen gen general advice for young people who are thinking about launching their first business and they have no, like no money in their pocket and what 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 would be the 
bits of advice you could give give uh, my, my like like i said earlier uh my case of having to sell that phone was out of like real sense of urgency because i really need to get this platform up and running like asap mm -hmm. but uh ordinarily you know if i had a job at that point or guaranteed income i wouldn't have had to have sold my phone so a be willing to bootstrap your company, you know what I mean? And you will have to make sacrifices. You know, you won't be going with your friends on every Friday night and blowing a quarter of your paycheck on beers at night and clubbing. Really commit to it, you know, build an MVP at the fraction of the cost. You'll learn about tech, even if it completely fails and you lose your, you know, like a couple of hundred bucks, at least you know, like the foundation, how it's done and how you scale this and build an MVP. And you don't have to build the next Uber, but you can build like an MVP, for example, of where uh, you know a driver can connect and chat with a passenger, then build on top of it. But uh, bootstrapping, you know, is a great way. The other thing I was going to say is, you know, I have failed, but I've also worked at companies that have failed, you know, and they've learned a lot and they teach you about not what to do. If you really want to get in the tech industry and learn, you have to learn how to sell, you know? So work in a tech company, get the experience, learn about what they do for outreach, sales, those experiences you can bring to your startup. And I would tell if you want to get in a startup and you're young, don't you don't have to build yours, just get a job in the community, learn as much as you can. Perfect. Great. Uh, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Miguel, for all your insights um, that you shared with us today. And you guys who came to the end of this episode, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to get more of this type of content, then please subscribe to the channel. And uh, we are open to your comments and questions. So if you have any, please post them below. And uh, take care. Have a, have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, have a good one, Natalia.